This morning I'm going to pick right back up where we left off last week. God has been getting to deal with me really in an unprecedented way. I have never had God speak so vividly, uh, speak so often. Uh, in fact, this morning I, I had a short open vision. I'm glad it was short because I was driving to the post office at the time. And I've heard other prophets talk about when God does that, they find out they're supposed to be where they're supposed to be when they get through driving. And I prefer that to be a 30-second thing instead of, you know, being out for two or three hours and come back and find out where you, where you are. But it, one of the things, that, if you ever notice, if you've lived anywhere besides Marshfield, back where we used to live, it was a, a low-lying area. And so the clouds would be way up in the sky. You know, it's, it's like they were, they were way off. And we noticed that after we moved here to Marshfield, that uh, the clouds almost feel like they're close enough to reach out and touch. This, this is a lot higher area. And the clouds were the same distance. We just moved closer to them. And this morning, as, as I was praying, it's just like I had an open vision while I was driving, and I saw heaven move closer. That's significant. You see, there are, there are times that heaven comes down. And several things goes in conjunction with this. That uh, it's like I said last week, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that's precipitating everything that I shared last week, and I shared six things, that people's chickens are coming home to roost. That means you're going to reap what you sow with uh, uh, quick results. That greater and swifter consequences are going to be for our decisions. That what you feed will grow and what you starve will die out. Prayer will take on a new power. Revival will first be individual, then corporate. And that I shared some about God's strategies. And, and all that's for a reason. God is coming to establish something in his people. And God told me this morning, this is something that only happens every few generations. Maybe in, in America, the last time that we had something like this was during Jonathan Edwards' time. But it's going to have a different dimension. That those that seek the face of God, God's going to start doing things in their life. But at the same time, and this is what rattled me to the core, he said, I've come down to see what man's up to. And I went, uh-oh. Because I find two times in the Bible that that happened. One was called the Tower of Babel. One was called Sodom and Gomorrah. The God said, I'll come down, and I will see what they have done. God is getting ready to come down to see what man has done. And there's going, and so things are going to accelerate in an unprecedented way. And, the two, and really to find out who's really walking with God, there are two things that they are going to emphasize. The blood of Jesus and the commandments of God. Now one of the things I have found out that we, we have whole sections of the body of Christ that don't emphasize his commandments, nor do they emphasize the blood. And then I'm seeing part of the Hebraic Roots movement that almost don't even talk about the blood anymore. It's got to be the blood and the commandments. If you try to do the commandments without the blood, it doesn't work. And if you try to walk just in the blood without the commandments, it doesn't work because the blood was to set us free so that we could walk in the commandments of God the way that God wanted to. Now, this morning is another one of those days you need to take out pen and paper because we're going to be covering a lot of things. The first thing that God told me, and I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. The first thing God has said is heaven has come down because the answers are waiting. The answers are waiting. Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 7, it says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. For everyone that asketh what? Receiveth. And he that seeketh what? Findeth. And he that knocketh, it shall be? Open. Okay. We have an open heaven. In the past, one of the interesting things about this in the Greek, it says, Seek and keep on seeking. It, it's, it's almost a perpetual motion. Keep on seeking till you get it. Yeah. Keep on knocking till it's open. Right. And right now, heaven's come down saying, all the seeking that you have ever done in your life, all the knocking that you've ever done in your life, all the asking that you've ever done, I'm coming down to give it to you. Yeah. It's never have gone to, it has never been this way in this generation. And this may be the last time this happens before the Lord returns. 
That's how crucial this is. Then Jesus goes on to say in verse 9, And what man is there of you whom if he ask, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask fish, will he give him a serpent? Ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask of him? Now, listen to me. I want you to set aside everything that you're hearing on Christian TV. This is not about asking for stuff. Turned to your neighbor and said, this ain't about stuff. This ain't about stuff because stuff doesn't solve problems. That's right. Have you ever thought, boy, if I could just get this, I'd be all right. Then you got it. Yeah, it wasn't all right, were you? No, because now you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay for the stuff that you got that you thought. Yeah, I'm going to say this. God wants to give us solutions to problems. The deep core of our problems does not involve stuff. It involves you. Who you are on the inside without stuff. And we've got to change some things. We're in a generation, and I have watched uh, videos on YouTube and other of those in the occult that have confessed this. How many know there's witchcraft going on in Park Avenue? Park Avenue is where all the advertising agencies are, and one of the biggest ones are at 666 Park Avenue. Hmm. Is that kind of a... And, and they, they brag, they're braggadocious about how they can manipulate society. Quit, the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world. Then why are you letting the world tell you what you want to eat, where you want to go, how you want to dress, what makes you happy? Some of the chaos that we're seeing in this generation is we have one or two generations that pornography has, has uh, established their sexuality. Pornography has its origin in Ashtaroth and Molech. So we have allowed occultism and satanic perversion of what God said should be, and we have, we have several generations that that has defined their whole concept of sexuality. Let me tell you something. That's got to be thrown aside. It's got to be thrown aside. How we dress, and sometimes I think they just push it to see how stupid everybody will be, you know, some of, the, some of the fashions. Some of them make Lady Gaga look normal. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, it's, it's at Kmart, it's at Walmart, all these different places. i got to dress like this one. Because this is what makes me cool. No, it makes you a fool. Yeah. Our dress is supposed to be different. There's something called Modesty. There's some stuff only your husband or wife is supposed to see. That's right. Come on. That's right. It ain't nobody else's business. It ain't nobody else's stuff. But yet, we, we dress this way because this is what the world wants to do. And I, I tell you, I, I've noticed by watching my wife because she, she is not connected to whatever trends are going on. And there has been years she says, I ain't buying nothing because it's hideous. And then you have people strutting down the street saying, I'm so cool. Yeah, you're coolly hideous, you know. Because that's the, quit letting the world define who you are, what it is to be cool. If the whole world is being a fool, how many know being a fool ain't cool? The world is moving toward more and more toward a Babylonian system. A Babylonian system is always government heavy. The government becomes the source of everything and then supplies everything. And then there's a transitioning even happening in America if we're not careful. We own the government. That's the way it was founded. The government is moving toward they owning us. That's Babylon. And therefore, it's all external. I look to the government to supply everything. They can't because the only way that they can supply to you is from taking it away from somebody else. Duh. 
And how many know that even in wherever we are in life, in our, in our economically, there are people that are a lot worse off? Jesus said the poor would ever be with you. So in reality, they need to take all your stuff to give it to somebody else. While well, we're expecting them to take the richest stuff, rich is, is a relevant term. The poorest of us, thus those of us living on minimum wage, are extremely rich compared to those in other nations. And we're having those in our government say that we need to even the world worldwide. That means for the poorest of us, they need to take our stuff and give it to somebody overseas. That's that mindset. That's that Babylonian mindset. Of course, except for our, our benevolent leaders who ride around in Lexus and fly in jets and do all these things because, of course, that's what's due them for their position. The kingdom of God works this way. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. What in you, if you're walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the blood of Jesus, is always greater than anything this world can give you. And it's time for us to look for internal things to bring happiness, to bring peace, and to bring, and to bring a, a, a level of, of, of tranquility that we've never experienced before because stuff on the outside can't do it. I've tried. I've shared before years and years ago, Mary and I, we're, we're, you know, God blessed us with a lot of money different times in our lives, and we walked through Walmart. We were depressed because there wasn't anything to buy, so we started believing for a bigger Walmart. <laughs> that just shows you sometimes how the f funny mindsets we get. And this was years ago. It don't matter what stuff you get. It matters who you are on the inside, who you're walking with. Almighty God, if Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of life, has moved on the inside of you, and what he's wanting to do, this is a new season. We say, Mike, I'm not there yet. That's the reason for this season. Ask, and God's going to start giving you solutions. We are in a new season of asking, listening, and receiving. They're, and the answers are going to come quickly. Yes, they are. And it, it's not always going to be an open vision. It's not always going to be a booming voice coming down from heaven. There were some things I was, I was seeking answers from God for this week that three minutes on a, on a news talk show in the morning after, after the regular news, Good Morning America, whatever it was, they had a doctor come on and within three minutes gave me some things that I've been seeking some answers for. Sometimes it can be for health. God can just adjust a little thing and it make dramatic results in your life. Or sometimes it's going to ca cause you to have to do some big things. How many know that when we discovered Leviticus chapter 11, I had been in the Bible all the time, but all of a sudden it's, we discovered it. <laughs> How many know that that took radical adjustments to our lives? But it had both physical and spiritual benefits. So as God gives us things, we need to start taking note of it. Now remember what I said last week too, that, that there are going to be quicker consequences for the decisions that we make. So we need to remember, ask before you do. Don't just do it because that's the way you've always done it, because the way you've always done it, the reason it didn't blow up in your face was God was trying to protect you from yourself, and it's time for us to start seeking the face of God, and when God says, okay, do it, then do it. If he says, don't do it, don't do it. I don't care if it's the way you've always done it. Has it really worked out this well for you up till now? Let's just be honest. How well has it worked for you? You know, the only way that you're going to get different results is to do something different. <sighs> Little things and big things. Number two, be a doer, not a wisher. Be a doer, not a wisher. James chapter 1 Verses 21 through 25, and these are some things that I, I have, uh, I'm going to go uh, 22 through 25. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Be a doer of the word, not a wisher only. I've seen so many people receive prophetic words from God. Okay, it's going to come to pass. What you doing about nothing? Well, one of these days, how many know that with that attitude, you can actually delay forever a prophetic word from coming to pass in your life? 
You've got, you got to put action to it. If God says you're supposed to go in a direction and your heart confirms that, start preparing for that action. I had a prophetic word spoken over me almost 30 years ago, and because I thought it was just going to come to pass by itself and didn't really work on my leg, 30 years later, it's just now starting to come to pass, and the only reason it was delayed was not the enemy, it was me, because I didn't understand. If I would have started preparing and dealing back then, I would be about 20 years ahead of where I am right now. And God is saying, you know, now if you do it, you can play so you can get some catch up. There's going to be some supernatural catching up because there's going to be faster consequences for your decision. Now, if you're doing the right things, how many know those consequences are really good? If you're doing the wrong things, that's really bad. And what God is saying is, I'm going to speak to you and start getting you to do the right things so that I can give you the consequences of what you're doing by my instruction. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, for if you are, but, but if any hear the word and be not a doer, what does he do? It's like he beholds it. Let's see. Actually, let's I'm going to finish verse 22 first. Be a doer of the word, not hear only, deceiving your own selves. How many people have heard a prophetic word or God has given you something, you turned around and used the very word that God gave you, and you deceived yourself with it? Now, this is a part of the prophetic you're not going to hear any of the prophets teach on because we have the attitude that if it's spoken of God, it's going to happen. Even Mary, when Gabriel appeared to her, she had to submit her body and herself to God. She had to submit to what God was doing. And when God gives us something, you got to submit to it so he can do it. you got to learn to flow with the kingdom, begin to flow in that direction. we got to be doers. Guys, once God gives the solution, we have got to plan to incorporate the solution and begin doing it. Sometimes getting the answer is easy. The implementation is the hard part. You got to come up with a plan of action. How do I set in motion? How do I work with God? You see, we, we have the idea and, and the way that some people preach the kingdom, it's God working for you. And God's just going to do it. You just, you just stand here and do the same things that you've always done, and God's just going to do it. God wants to work with you, not for you. His greatest joy is to come alongside. That's why the Holy Spirit in the Greek, that, that helper is parakletos. He wants to come alongside and help facilitate and empower and guide you in what you're doing. And if you're doing nothing, he comes alongside and he can do nothing. That's why over and over again it says that if we meditate on the word of God day and night, everything our hands shall do, everything our hands shall do, everything our hands shall do shall be blessed. If your hands aren't doing anything, you can't get to the blessing. You've got to be activating and doing what God begins to show you. God wants you to move from wishing it would come to pass to becoming the agent to bring it to pass in your life. James goes on in, ver in chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And one of you say unto them, oh, but my thing is not clipping and pasting the way it's supposed to this morning. Verse 17. I hate that when I tell I want it to clip here and here and it goes a verse up before it. Verse 17. Even so, if it hath not works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. James 2.17. Even so, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. You've got to put action to what God shows you. You've got to put action. You can have, God can deposit faith within you, but if you allow that faith to be alone, it will die. He goes on to say, Yea, amen, say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. By my works. When God speaks to you, make a plan of action and begin to move forward. 
Guys, there are, there are things... Just in the last couple of months, and some of it I've been, I've been working on since March, that as I'm moving forward with it, I mean, we're doing a lot of shaking and baking with the ministry. Uh, we've, we're basically folding United Full Gospel Churches into RFI and some different things. And I'm finding that as I'm beginning to just simply be obedient to God in doing that, I'm seeing every day more and more of it strategic. More and more of it strategic. And some of it, to be frank, it has been kind of a hassle for me to change around and to do and stuff. But you know what I'm already seeing? It was worth the hassle. It was worth the change. It was worth the effort to change it. And see, what the devil's counting on is you not wanting to change. You know, the, the old saying that, you know, a fool keeps on doing the same thing and expects different results. How I many know there's not supposed to be any fools in the kingdom? God also told me, he says, we need to be faithful, which is consistent in the execution of the solution God gives you. Satan doesn't care if you do it for a week or two and then drop back to your old habits. Doesn't care. What terrifies him is your consistent application of God's word and the solution that God has provided. The consistent. When it gets hard, the reason it gets hard is he's trying to withstand your implementation. We have the idea that if, if it was of God, it would have all been easy. Show me that in the Bible. Well, you know, there was Jehoshaphat, and they just sent out the praise and worshipers to go out and praise and worship in front, and God gave them the victory. Put yourself not in the back lines watching the praisers and the worshipers. You don't go out to battle with a drum and a tambourine. They have arrows and battle axes and swords, and you got a tambourine. How many know that for those praisers and worshipers, that was not an easy thing? Are you going to hit them with their tambourine if they break the line? I mean, these guys were out praising and they were sweating profusely, not because they worked up. It's like, oh, Lord, if you don't move, I'm dead. <laughs> uh, you know, I know, I know. Boy, if this doesn't work, Joshua's going to say, you know, Joseph, any more praisers? <laughs> that was a hard thing for them. Can you imagine before they, they did all this, those praisers and worshipers saying, boy, I'm glad all the big boys got the swords. Whew. You know, God has called me on the back line with nothing but a tambourine. Whew. I'm going to do what? <laughs> Lord, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. I want to stand back here with the stuff and this, I, I, I am your cheerleader. Go guys, get them. Go guys, get them. <laughs> And God says, no, I want you on the front line. Not with an M16, but with a tambourine. That was hard. We read, we read through those stories and we think, well, that was easy. No, it was really, really, really hard for the guys who did it. But they were faithful, and they did it whether they felt like it or not. Because, I, I, and you know, we, we talk a lot about going with the peace of God. And what I have found people have, have mistakenly done, and I'm, I've been guilty of this myself, of there, there are times, no, no, you, you know the difference, there are times when your flesh feels relief, and your flesh will feel relief when you don't do that which God tells you, because it was hard, and that bondage goes, oh, I'm relieved you're not going to do it. People say, I just don't have peace about that. When your spirit has peace, it is peace beyond your understanding. I'm doing this. It scares the fire out of me. My flesh is screaming, don't do it, don't do it. But on the inside, I just know God's, that's the kind of peace that passes all understanding. That's the kind of peace that brings down Goliath. That's the kind of peace that changes the tide of things, not about what puts your flesh at ease. Because anytime you grab up a nail and a hammer, your flesh isn't going to like it. Come on. But God is saying, 
It's hammering time. There are some things of your flesh that you need to crucify, and then you can take that same hammer that you just crucified the flesh, and you can take out a demonic force with it. But the hammer got the power from it nailing something to the cross. That's not even in my notes. Number three, you're going to have to keep a journal to record your answers and plans of action. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run that readeth it. Now, in the context of Habakkuk, it was that it was not yet time for it. With us, guys, my best messages I never preached because I didn't write it down. Some of the most profound things that God has told me, later on he had to remind me because I did not write it down. You have got to put together a system of journaling what God has told you because it is going to be crucial in this hour because he's going to give you step one, then step two, then step three. And what happens if you miss step two? You ladies that have baked a cake, how many know that if you forget to put sugar or salt or something in the recipe, you don't come out with what you expected to come out with? No matter how much you beat it, no matter how much you pray over it, no matter how long you bake it, it's not going to be that way. And the, and the kingdom of God is always succinct. You do one, two, three, and then the devil's down. And God wants to give you solutions to more than just one area of your life. He's going to give you some solutions for your health. He's going to give you some solutions for your wealth. He's going to give you some solutions for your workplace. He's going to give you some solutions for your family. You've got to write them down because as you go back and review them out of the meditation of those and praying over those, God's going to begin giving you solutions. It's one thing to understand what God's trying to show you and another thing to be able to have the Holy Spirit help you formulate how to put it to action. You don't have to go out and buy a, a $50, you know, you, you can go get one of those little themed notebooks up at Walmart for what, a, I think this time of year they're 99 cents to help the kids go back to school with. Just start writing them down, writing them down. It will encourage you. It will encourage you. In fact, I just heard this last week, and this is the, the, when I originally taught... Uh, 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 biblical Dynamics of a Spirit-Filled Prayer Life, the original one before I re redid it as Biblical Life uh, Prayer Dynamics. I had one lady wrote back, she said, you know, I did this back in the 90s when you taught that, and she said, I have journaled volumes. And she said that it has been a comfort to me. Because when you're down, you can go back and read your journals. When you're in the heat of battle, what was it that God said to do next? You can go back and read your journals. It's an important aspect. I mean, even in the natural, uh, professionals are taught when you brainstorm, brainstorm on paper because when you're brainstorming, you may come up with that wonderful thing, but you went four or five things down and you forgot what that was. Write it down. Write it down. In the natural, guys, there have been multi-million dollar corporations that originated on a napkin. They got an inspired idea and they wrote it down. And there have been many entrepreneurs that are broke and in poverty today because when inspiration came, they didn't write it down. This, this, is, this is not a time to waste in God giving you answers that you forget. This is a time of God giving you strategic answers and then you begin to pray over them so the Holy Spirit can come alongside and help facilitate their implementation in their lives. There, there are several things that God really emphasized this morning to me that heaven is more ready to provide solutions than you are for them to come. Heaven is getting ready to give you some solutions to problems you didn't even know you had. You have lived with them so long, they have become normal. And how many know right now the world is trying to put a new normal on us? I am old normal. I am kingdom of God normal. I will be that normal. 
I don't want the new normal that the world's trying. Because the world, I mean, guys, we just had a political convention. Now, yeah, yeah, they did bring God and, and Jerusalem being the capital of Israel back into their platform because it was rammed down their throats. The majority of them booed it. That's their normal. And they mask their normal with a piece of paper. How many know that in other conventions, that would have not gotten one boo? You see, the, the divide is getting bigger. Now, they can try to mask it and, and try to politically spin it, but the divide is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've got to find out how to make sure I'm totally on the side that God's working on and not on the other side. I want to be totally in the light of the word. I don't want to be half standing in the world and half standing in the kingdom when God, when God comes and judges because God's coming down to see where everybody is. That is exhilarating and terrifying all at the same time. Because, guys, now listen to me. Mark my words. What you have gotten away with in the past and thought that nobody ever saw, you're not getting away with anymore. One of the things that God told me is that the feasts this year are for real. He told me that, and I, I, I was sitting down. I had to stand up so I could sit down. Because we kind of go through, well, you know, we have the Feast of Trumpets, la, 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 la. And then we have the 10 days of all, you know, and then we, we're all going through the motions and everything. Don't go through the motions this year. Dear God, do not go through the motions. We're already having trumpets manifest before the trumpets. God is speaking before trumpets. Because there's so many announcements to make, it's going to take him a while. God said this year... The days of awe are for real. They are for real. They say, well, okay, what does that mean? For those of you who don't know about the feasts, the time between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement is known as the days of awe. That's 10 days to get right. That if there's anything between you and God, you've got 10 days to get it right. And then we always talk about the counting of the Omer. Everybody wants to count the Omer in, in the spring. Heaven's got a count done. Every morning it's 10, 9, 8, 7. Church, do you hear me? 6, 5, 4. Every day there's going to be a countdown. Because I, not only do I have to make it right between me and God, but if I've done somebody wrong, you better get that right because the king will make you answerable for it. This is a time to make, this year of all the years, this is not a year to play. This is not a year to be religious. This is a year you better do it because when the day of atonement comes, things are going to change either extremely for the good or extremely for the bad, depending upon where you are. That's why I said there's going to be quicker consequences. And it's not going to be just for that day. You're going to set your course maybe for the rest of your life. How many know we ain't playing church no more? We are not playing church anymore. Don't go through the motions. This may be the first time in your life that there will be consequences for entering into the Day of Atonement without a clean hat, with clean hands and a clean heart. No playing and no crying after the fact. Because it's going to be like God said, I have done what I have done because you did what you did. And so if everything turns to hell after the day of atonement, it's because you didn't take it seriously. If everything becomes hell in the life of the devil in your life, it's because you entered in it correctly because the king comes down to judge. I think it's so essential that God said, I have come down to look. And that's really what the Day of Atonement is. How many know there is a day that Jesus is physically going to ride on a white horse and dry, go through the Valley of Armageddon on his way to setting down on, on Mount Olives, and he's going to come down to see what man has done and judge it. This is a type and a shadow of that fulfillment. He's got to do this so the church can get free to be ready when he does the other. That's how close we are to some things, guys. 
God also said this year the Feast of Tabernacles is going to have a new anointing. A new anointing. What does that mean? Now, how many know that we, there are a lot of different ways of celebrating tabernacles? This is more than going camping. This, this is more than just, than just fixing a, a, a sukkah out on your property. Because before Jesus came, tabernacles was to remind us that Israel dwelt in booze as they were waiting for the promise. After Jesus came, we discovered Emmanuel. God came and tabernacled among us. And this tabernacles, God is going to begin establishing a new anointing in your life to tabernacle with him. That if you'll put effort into it and seek him, he's here. How many times in the Bible does it say, seek him while he may be found? Seek him. Seek him. God is saying, seek me, I'm going to be here, and I'm going to establish a new level of presence in your life so that you can tabernacle with me well beyond the eighth day. I want to loose a new beginning into your life. Because what's coming, you're going to need it. How many know that uh, you can go through the fiery furnace and have revival? Or you can go through the fiery furnace and find out what a crispy critter is. And what made the difference was not the fire. It was where the individual was with God. You can be thrown into the lion's den and get the biggest, fluffiest pillow that you have ever seen in your life to lean back on to sleep that night or ended up being lunch. And the difference was not in the lion's it was in the one thrown into the lion's den. What's going to help you in the days ahead is what God, you've allowed God to do in your life. It doesn't matter what you've went through. It matters what you've been brought through by God. All of us have a past. All of us have had situations. None of us had a perfect life. Some of us far less perfect than others. But God is greater than what you've went through. God is greater, and you've got to allow him to come in to minister to you where you are to get you to where you need to be. The cross is greater than your past. The cross is greater than your wounds. The cross is greater than anything you've ever went through in your life. There was a guy that used to be a slave trader that thought nothing that if, that if the officials were coming that he would throw all his slaves into the ocean and let them drown. He thought nothing of it because they were nothing more than material to him. They were nothing more than merchandise to him. But one day God got a hold of his heart and he picked up a pen and wrote, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, who saved a wretch like me. And let me tell you something, probably when he wrote it down, wretch was underlined, boldened, and in capitals. When he wrote that, he meant that. And yet he ended up being a pastor. And he ended up being the pastor for the man who almost destroyed his health, being a legislator in Great Britain to get slavery abolished in Great Britain. The man who used to be the a slave trader. You see, it does it. The cross takes your past and turns it into a testimony. It doesn't keep it as a bondage that you've got to live with. It turns it into a testimony because there are people, I don't care where you have been in life, there's somebody who went through more. And I don't care if we're, if we're just dealing with, with being sexually abused as a kid or a violent past. Or I don't care if it's even mind control. There's somebody who went through worse than you. And the cross is greater. The kingdom of God is greater. God told me something this morning because I, I, I have pondered. Guys, there, there's a lot of what I'm seeing on, on, on Christian TV that it, it's, it's all starting to make sense. You know, Mary and I have, have went through a weird road or weird journey. We know stuff that most Christians don't know because of the journey that we've had to, we've had to walk. 
And so we, we do know about what the occult has done with mind control and with programming and all this stuff. And when you know the basis of it, all you got to do to see the confirmation a lot of times is to look at Christian television, and a lot of what they're calling their prophetic is not prophetic. It is programming, and you, you, you have certain ones that are calling themselves prophetic, and what they're doing is they're rebuilding the programming in the people's minds that God's trying to tear down. You know what? That's getting ready to change, too. Why is it getting ready to change? Here's what God told me this morning. I told Mary, and it's like, I, I can't figure out how he's going to do it. Now, remember he's saying, based upon where your heart is, that's the way things are going to be set in motion. We have people whose hearts are right, but their, their minds have been split by what the enemy has done. There's been programming there that has, they're, they're, they find themselves doing what their hearts don't want to do. God, for those individuals, is getting ready to judge the bad parts and separating them from the vessel. At the same time, he's going to give all the gifts that were stolen by those parts and return them to the vessel. God told me that. I went up and told Mary, and I said, how's he going to do that? I don't know. How, how does God give a lobotomy? <laughs> you know? But it's like he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, get rid of the chaff, and give the wheat. He can do it. But if the heart... That's, that's why I said last week we're going to see people that we thought were the most despicable people that would never walk with God and they're going to be pure of heart. What God's getting ready to do and he's going to totally set them free because they had a good heart but they had all this junk put up here. And then we're going to see a lot of people that we thought were big in ministry with the shakers and the movers and in, in different areas that that all was a programmed facade and on the inside they were as black as coal. The facade's getting ready to be removed. Oh, Mike, that couldn't be so. I have talked to experts. Now, I'm not an expert in this field, but I have spoken with experts that know pastors of large churches that on the inside, they're satanic. But they get up, speak in tongues, prophesy, lay hands on people, and then abuse kids because another part comes up. What's in the heart is what's going to matter. And you better take care of what is in your heart. Make sure your heart, if your heart is right with God and you call out, this is the season that the bad is going to be taken care of. It's this season. You say, oh, I've done it before. You've never been in this season before. It may have been 200 years since there was a season like this in the earth. And if I will cry out, heaven is here to answer and how it doesn't matter how the devil has scrambled eggs God can put it back together he is in the job of putting minds and lives and situations back together heaven is crying out ask ask me for solutions ask me for solutions but don't ask me if you don't want to do it don't ask me I'm almost feeling from heaven sometimes what I've, I've had people come and ask me for solutions and when I give them to them, they don't like them, don't want to do them. And they get mad at me when nothing changes. You can't, stay in areas where we need solutions, you cannot continue doing the same things and expect different results. That is wishful thinking and has no, li has no place in the life of the believer. I go to God's instruction, I go to God's spirit, and I say, how do I attack this problem? How do I bring down this Goliath? How do I bring down the walls? How do I cross this ocean? How do I part this sea? Father, show me how to do it, and I will do exactly what you tell me to do when you tell me to do it. How many think Joshua didn't necessarily want to go seven days around the walls of Jericho? And by the seventh day, he didn't want to have to go around it seven times. Let me know that the big as that city was once was enough. Well, God, it's, it's been five times. Can't we get it now? It's been six times. Can't. None of them said that. God said seven. We're going to walk seven. I don't care, Jimmy. If I've got to push you, we're going to get that seven done. And then when we had the seven done, we had to have the strength to blow the shofars. Following God's instruction always brings results. You see, there, there's, there's two components to it. God's instruction and heaven coming down to empower that instruction 
probably in a way that you've never seen before. What are you talking about, Mike? Did you ever see a race car? I don't know if you ever watched some of the Vin Diesel movies or something where they have the, the, the supercharged cars and all of a sudden the guy reaches down and turns on something called nitric oxide. The kingdom of God is the nitric oxide to your doing. And God is saying, you know what? Go ahead and hit the turbo button, baby, because this time is going to work. Hit the turbo button. But you see, when the turbo is hit, everything is accelerated. That's why God is saying, get right now. Get right now. Get it in line now. Because once the turbo button is hit, if it's bad seed, you're going to get a bumper crop. If it's good seed, you're going to get a bumper crop. Whatever was planted, you're going to get a bumper crop. There is no way of hiding it. How many know that once the crop comes, you can't tell your neighbors you planted something else? Kind of late. I know it looks like corn, but I really planted taters. You can't do that. And in times past, we didn't have the information that we needed for God to come down like he's getting ready to come down. We didn't, we didn't understand the commandments of God. We, didn't, we weren't in sync with the kingdom. We were in sync with Babylon. We were doing Babylonian holidays and not God's holidays. In so many areas, we didn't have the... We weren't, uh, guys, I have seen Christians get saved. Well, yes, brother, because they finally did the commandments. No, they finally understood the blood. They finally understood the cross. Some of them were in ministry. Did you know John Wesley was in ministry when he got saved? He actually ran across some people that were really walking with God. It really showed up what he was, and he ended up getting saved. Even though he was a genius as far as Scripture was concerned, he could quote the book of Deuteronomy from memory by the time he was seven but he didn't have the blood. Had a facade. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the Spirit of God. We have the commandments of God. And we have been warned. We have been taught. We have been prepared. So God says, so now, get, get, your, get your house in order. Get your things in order. Seek me. Let me begin implementing the solutions so that when I turbocharge this by my kingdom coming down, you don't end up being turbocharged off a cliff. He did it this way because of his grace. And he did it this way because this generation needs to have this so they can be prepared for the journey. It's more than just about you and me. It's about the body finishing the journey. My question to you this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready? There's no hiding. This is the year that there's no hiding. God told me that everything that has been hid is going to be revealed. And guys... There's some Republicans saying, oh, that's wonderful. If everybody could see what the Democrats have done, everybody's getting ready to see a bunch that the Republicans have done that wasn't good either. Everything, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Isn't that what the book of Hebrews tells us? There is a shaking that's coming. It's going to shake the heavens before it's through. But the only thing that won't shake is the kingdom. The right is going to scramble to see if they can do damage control. The left is going to scramble to see if they can do damage control. And the only ones on either side they are going to really make are the ones that's going to hit their knees and just get right with God and just come true. So these are some things that they did in the past, and it was wrong. It was wrong. I mean, we discovered some from the state of Missouri that Mary and I have been repenting of. Do you know, and, and uh, there, there are a lot of things about Mormonism that I don't agree with. 
But how many know that we had a governor in Missouri issue an, an executive order for our citizens to go and to kill every Mormon in the state? Didn't know that about Missouri, did you? And they, and they had to flee. Many of them didn't even have, they had to flee so quickly with their kids they didn't have shoes on their feet. And it was the middle of winter and, they, and, the, and the people had bad frostbite because they had to flee this state because the governor said, I give citizens the right to kill every Mormon they can find. I mean, that brought a curse on Missouri. I don't care if we theologically didn't agree with them or not. That is no excuse for murder. So that's something that we've had to pray over for the state of Missouri, asking God to break that curse off of us and to forgive that sin. And in doing this, it's not validating Mormonism or, or, or invalidating Mormonism. It is saying that act was despicable. It was sin. It was from the pits of hell. And God was nowhere in the equation. Not right. And see, God's bringing things like that to light so that we can pray. Because it, it still affects the land unless we as believers say, Lord, forgive this people, forgive every Missourian. Father, forgive the state legislature. Forgive the office of the governor who gave that. Father, break that curse off this land by the blood of Jesus. We repent for that. And we plead the blood of Jesus over that innocent blood that was spilt. And Father, we ask that Satan can no longer use it against our state. That, I don't know about you guys, but when I found that, I was horrified. Horrified. Inexcusable. And then the state turned around and charged the people that we were slaughtering for the cost of raising up the militia to kill them. You see what governments do if they're not walking with God. It can even sound righteous. It was a social justice. No, it wasn't. It was an injustice. And it was an abomination before heaven. You see, these things are going to start coming out. Our government has done a lot of good things, but our government has also done a lot of bad things in the name of good. Like every other government. God's coming down to visit, to reveal, to judge. And if you're walking with God, this is a good thing. The only way that you can ever get free is that which has held you in bondage must be judged. That happens every time a miracle happens. Did you know that if you see someone healed of something, it's because God came and judged that disease? If somebody was in bondage or a demon gets cast out, it's because God came and judged that thing and removed it from their lives. There's no such thing as freedom without judgment. There's no such thing as a miracle without justice. That's why when God created the heavens and the earth, it was Yahweh Elohim. He had to balance justice and mercy together. And our problem, we have been so hyper-mercy that we have been given mercy to the very things that's trying to kill us. I'm like, I'm like that old country comedian that was stuck up a tree with a bobcat. Lord, shoot up amongst us. One of us need the relief. I trust the justice of God. I trust the judgment of God. Lord, let your hammer fall. I need a solution. I need the victory. I need you to judge it so that I can be judged free. And if there's anything that I need to do to get that thing completely out of my life before you judge it, Father, show me, give me the solution. Give me the prayer to say, give me the thing to do that's going to pop it on its head so hard that hell is going to wish that it had never messed with my life. But the time that you're through with it, God, I want it out of my life. I hate it. I despise it. 
To love God is to hate evil, and I hate this thing, and I want it out of my life. I don't want it to be passed down to my children. The buck stops here, Lord, and I'm going to take it to the cross, and I'm not going to let go of that cross until I am free, and my descendants are free, and that you have established the kingdom in a new way that I have never experienced before. That's what this hour is about. Solutions. The easy solutions and the hard solutions. The bigger the problem, sometimes the harder the solution. But the other side of it is freedom. If we're willing to do the hard things, the easy things will be easy. Because God has a purpose on the other side of this for you. He wants you free. He wants you happy. He wants the disappointment to dissolve. Because sometimes our disappointment was we thought God was going to do it way back when when he's getting ready to do it now. Not understanding. You know, there's some things that Mary and I have had to pray about that we'd like God to take care of. But if God didn't do it right, it would absolutely destabilize this nation beyond repair. Beyond repair. But God has worked so long to bring it to the place that that which can be shaken is going to be shaken, but that which is will remain is of his kingdom. And there is a foundation in this nation that God set. Yeah, there were some things the devil set too. But God says, you know what? That's going to shake, rumble, and roll. But that which I have done will remain. Let me tell you something. It's more than enough for this nation. It's more than enough for your life. It's more than enough for your family. It's more than enough. Are you tired of your life of getting 99, 9, or 90% good and 10% poison? I mean, no, 10% poison will kill you. It's like the old concept of rat poison. Rat poison is 99% food, 1% arsenic. And the rat discovers the 1%. But after it's too late. God says, you know what? I'm tired of my people feeding on things that have been poisoned by the enemy. I'm getting ready to separate. So this is, you can know the clean from the unclean, the holy from the unholy. That which is of God and that which is from Babylon is going to be very clear by the time the dust settles in our life, in our nation, on this planet. Father, I just thank you for your word. Father, we enter into your feasts reverently. We enter into them with great trepidation and respect for you and your kingdom. Father, I believe that as we ask, we have a new door, a new special opportunity for it to be answered. And Father, my prayer is not for the answers to come. They're already there. The answers are waiting. But, Father, what I ask for is you to give us the grace to ask and the grace to do. Father, give it to us in our lives in a new and a real way. For this hour, for kingdom purpose, with kingdom ability. And I ask it in the name of Jesus.